Hello, Jono. Great to have you here. Yeah, nice to be here. Uh, so, uh, Jono, you work for the hottest AI startup on planet Earth, which is Answer AI. Is that correct? Uh, possibly a biased evaluation, but uh, I think so, yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, the, how is it? Uh, how does it feel? Yeah, it's really good. I, I'm trying to think. So when we announced it at um, at Europe's, everyone was coming uh -huh. up and saying, "Hey, you know, you, your your launch post said very cryptic things. You know, what what are you yeah. actually working on?" And the the answer is the same now. Like we we genuinely don't know. I mean, we have some ideas, but it's this very open ended uh, research organization, and so mm -hmm. working there is also very open ended um, and a very open question of like. What even does that look like? And now we're a few months in, we're slowly starting to figure out, you know, the flow of things. But uh, yeah, it's been very exciting trying to actually figure it all out rather than being able to jump into a more established role and say, oh, this is what I do. It's very well defined. Um, this is what it looks like. Mm -hmm. I'm still like, oh, I'm still figuring it out. <laughs> you know, uh, myself and I bet the entire community, you know, we're rooting for you guys. So uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's great to hear. But Jono, the reason I wanted to talk to you and I wanted to talk to you for a while, and this podcast is just a pretext because you do so many things so amazingly well. And I wanted to maybe ask you how you think about things, where do you get the motivation, the drive to do so? Do you think that this is something that we could do on the podcast today? Yeah, I mean, if that's what you want to talk about, we can... We can dig in. I, I didn't have much expectations as to a conversation direction. So, yeah, that sounds as good as beautiful, <laughs> beautiful, 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 beautiful. So, uh, Jono, you, you obviously uh, work on uh, cutting edge LLM things right now at Answer AI, and all this information is from your Twitter account. So, I'm not sharing anything that would be private. Mm -hmm. So, so those are LLMs, right? NLP. And then uh, previously you contracted with Playground AI. So that's uh, generative uh, AI, right? Images, stable diffusion. Mm -hmm. And uh, you also uh, grafted a macro lens on your phone. You at some point went hunting for tardigrades with your microscope. And right now you're also growing purple tomatoes in the hopes of, have, of having a purple uh, pizza sauce. Like, Zono, th those are amazing things across such a vast uh, spectrum of domains. So how do you pull it off? How do you fit all of that into a single day? Like, that, <laughs> does your day also have 24 hours like mine? Or It, it definitely does. Yeah, <laughs> that's quite a fun random sample of, of past things. But, you know, I think... So all of those are actually the same thing. A okay. And I'll explain. Um, what, I, what I tend to do, like a pattern I've noticed, is you see something and there's this, like, this naivete and optimism of like, that should be doable. I should be able to do that. That can't be that hard, you know? Um, and part of that is like, you know, knowing, okay, cool, I have some skills, but a lot of that's just this, broad optimism of, ah, I'm sure it'll work out. Then you start trying to do the thing and it's like, oh, okay, it's not as easy as I thought it would be or there's some complications, which is why it has been hard. Um, but then I'm very stubborn to like, okay, but no, it, it feels like I should have been able to do it. Now there's some error, but we're going to keep on plowing through. Um, and then you figure it out and then it's very exciting because, oh, now I can do the thing I hoped I could do or something like it or I've discovered something else along the way. Um, and then for me, I think a trait that I've inherited from my parents who are uh, teachers or very like much passionate about passing on information is like, oh, well, I had to go through all this work to do this thing that I thought would be quite cool. And I don't want other people to have to do that the hard way either. Like I'd much rather uh, explain and share and, and tell people how to do that. Um, and so that's mm -hmm. kind of like my little mini journey on every, I serially collect hobbies. I mean, you mentioned tomatoes. That's like a very recent, oh, cool, I'm doing some some hydroponics and playing with some plants, but it's, it's, it's any hobby, anything that seems like, Oh, surely it's not that hard to do some genetic engineering. Surely it's not that hard to do some electronics. Surely it's not that hard to whatever the like current thing I'm excited about. Oh, painting like that. That would be fun to get better at that. 
it's like, oh, that shouldn't be too hard. Oh, that's actually really hard. Oh, okay, I figured out some ways to make it better. I'm like, okay, now I'm really excited to go like tell everybody in my life, hey, do you guys want to learn how to, <laughs> you know, do these kind of paintings or do these kind of things? Um, yeah. So I think you you made it sound in the intro like, oh, these things are so disconnected. But to me, it's the same sort of pattern. Um, whether that's working something out in a video game or as a hobby, or whether that's my day job, which is kind of also just doing that. I love this. Uh, I absolutely love this because you captured sort of the entire journey of getting into something and it's like a full circle. You first are a student and then you try to teach it to others. And in the process of teaching it, you also learn even more. Uh, but you also have this track record that you can show, hey, I did this, I did, I did that. It's absolutely fabulous. But uh, uh, how do you pick what to get into? Is it a calculated sort of process where you think, oh, I'm going to learn hydroponics because then I will be able to do this or that, or I will do this in electronics because then I will be able to do this or that? Or is it more of like, Hey, I'm today. I, I'm excited about this, so I want to learn more about that area. Which of those would it be? So, some of my decisions historically have been very much like considered. Oh, I'd like to have a lot of positive impact, and so I'm going to choose the direction that I'm going for study or for work in a direction that seems like it could enable something like that. So some of those have been those larger like driving motivations of, oh, why would I pick to study this versus that? It's like, well, I think I can bring this back into ecology and conservation or whatever the like domain. Um, maybe this is useful in health. So that kind of like very noble thing. But when I don't have an obvious direction like that, then a lot of the more immediate decisions, I kind of think of it as just following the curiosity gradient. Like, oh, okay. <laughs> If I'm, if I'm struggling to have like, oh, I don't know what the big picture is. I don't know what the future is going to look like. I don't know what models or techniques are going to be applicable. It's like, oh, well, that doesn't really matter because I, in the past, what's worked is to say, well, this thing is fun and interesting. Um, and previous times that I've done that, the fun and interesting things have almost always turned out to be useful down the line. Um, and so, yeah, that like follow the local curiosity gradient within maybe some constraints that tends to be my default for, I'd say, most of the decisions. And then, obviously, like as you're going along, you can be evaluating, oh, that was fun. Maybe I'm done with this hobby because it wasn't really going anywhere versus like, oh, this is something I could actually see myself devoting a lot more time to. Maybe I'll try and bring that into my professional life or focus on that more, more thoroughly. So it doesn't seem like you overthink things. You just, you know come up with an idea, ah, maybe this will be fun, interesting, or useful. And then you give it a go and you evaluate based on experience, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a hard one lesson because I do have that tendency to overthink first. You know, I, I need to analyze all the, all the possible futures. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, that's, the, <laughs> that's at least the goal. The, the target I'm aiming for is to, yeah, do that a bit more playfully. So, you know, I, I have the tendency myself and you know, I, I constantly find that this is such a waste of time beyond a certain point to keep thinking about something because one idea that I'm, you know, like playing around with or trying to learn more about is that the map in your mind is not the terrain, you know, and it just proves to be the case so often. And then I just try something and it feels completely different than I assumed that it would. And it often takes just such, such a small bit of effort to get that feeling. Hey, is this, is this something that, that I like or not? But, uh, no, this, this sounds terrific. And, uh, Jono, is that how you got into AI? Just uh, following the curiosity gradient? Um, sort of, I mean, the way I got into AI was because it seemed like I would need to be able to do something like that to make some, make these predictions based on this data um for a project that someone just they said oh you know you know computers could you join me on this project it's going to be really fun we'll do a lot of sampling in the wilderness we'll also do some computer stuff which is why i need you i said sure that same thing right how hard could it be like that sounds like something i should be able to do uh, and of course it was actually very hard um but <laughs> yeah um i think the reason i kept with it is because it was playing around and um also seeing like, oh, this is useful. I'm using this for my own things or finding ways to incorporate it because I want to learn more. 
Um, definitely then the, uh, the generative AI side, that was completely fun, curiosity driven. Um, so I've been doing more like traditional data science consulting and like uh, discriminative deep learning. Um, and I got pretty burnt out over COVID. Um, by the end of 2020, I was like, you know, really struggling to even look at the computer. I was kind of like feeling really sick and down. Uh, and so I took some time off completely. I had another hobby, which was um, spiders and like uh, macro photography. So I did that just out sitting under a tree all day. Um, and then after a long break, it was like, okay, okay, I'm almost ready to start like poking this computer thing again, because I know the computer used to be something I enjoyed doing and it had become something that I just like hated. Uh, I was like, okay, I need to start like finding something that's fun and that's inconsequential because I've been trying to do these big projects, you know, big, it's going to change agriculture. It's going to, you know, have some big impact. Uh, it's like, I need something that's completely like not going anywhere silly. And so I started doing some creative coding and then started playing with um, this thing called Clip had just come out. So like, can we combine Clip with GANs um, to do like text to image? But it was like, you know, it all just looks like a mess of color, but you can see a face in there and that's really fun. Um, so that, yeah, of course that felt like completely inconsequential, just really fun, but it was interesting. Oh, we should be able to do this. Well, it's actually harder than we thought. Let me teach other people how to do this because I think it's really cool. Um, and then, yeah, by the time a few years later, everyone's getting excited about diffusion models and generative AI. It's like, oh, well, I just accidentally had been doing that for several years because it was fun. Um, and that was, awesome. yeah, turned out a very lucky, a lucky side, side quest. Wow. Well, I, I love this. That's, that, that's, that, that's just, you know, uh, mind blowing, deep, terrific. And sort of following your curiosity, you were able to get to the cut, cutting edge, right? Like uh, right on top of, of current research. So that's an amazing feat in its own right. Um, why do you think you were able to do this? Because, you know, a lot of people who don't study machine learning, don't study AI, they say that the papers are hard to follow. Um, what, what was your approach that you took here to this playful experimentation? I think there's a few different things. I think if I tried to start reading diffusion papers 10 years ago when I was a beginner, I would have found them incredibly intimidating. I, I wouldn't have been able to do cutting edge research straight away. Um, mm -hmm. So there's the progression that you have of, if you're doing different projects and you're trying different things, you can slowly be building up this backlog of tools that every new thing you can apply them to and have a bit of a boost. So I think part of it's just the I don't know, luck and experience of having done lots of other projects and figured out things times before, you have this like toolbox to say, oh, last time I had to read a paper and I, it had this weird like little thing that meant some, and that's all that was. And then it had this other thing like an E that's like expected value. And I had to figure this out for a biology practical way back in the day. You know, like if you've done all of these pieces, then there's less new stuff every new project. Um, but then even that, like, when I was trying to figure out the, say, clip plus VQGAN or like diffusion models, you know, when you see a project, you often see the final result of lots and lots of work. Somebody started mm -hmm. with some simple code, then they added this, then they added that, then they changed the data loader, then they made it so they could do distributed, then they added this, and, that, and then, oh, configurable. And so you see this final result, and it's just this big monolith or this big paper. Um, and so, yeah, I think when I'm coming to something like that, I don't try and fit all of that in my head because they don't have that all in their head from the start. It's more like, okay, how do I get rid of almost all of this and go right back to, okay, I'm a little dumb, but I can imagine adding noise to a thing. So let me start there. Can I crapify an image by adding some noise? Okay, now I need a model that's predicting something of that shape. Okay, I've done segmentation. I know what a unit is from there. Can I use a unit I'm familiar with, maybe fast AI's unit to try and predict this noise. Okay, cool. I've got that piece in. Like, okay, now I need to be able to sample from this. Oh, it looks horrible. What's wrong? Oh, I need to try tweaking that, you know, plotting out the schedules, like everything. You can visualize the, the numbers at different stages. You can look at the intermediate results. Oh, I'm starting to see something emerging there. Oh, I just needed to train it for longer. Now it's looking a bit more clear. Oh, I'd forgotten this thing. Now it's looking an even bit better. And then slowly you like building back up. And before you know it, you're back to something that looks like the paper or that looks like the project. Um, but there's no way you can just look at the final result. Oh, I understand this. Nobody does that, you know? 
um, you have to break it down into pieces. Okay, this is a piece I've seen before. This is a piece I've seen before. This bit's new. Uh, what is going on? Okay, I can do this bit first. Ah, then that's how it fits together. Um, yeah, and I think that's just a function of having done that same process, you know, in different places enough times that you get that feeling like, oh, this is overwhelming, but I think I can figure it out. Like you mentioned, nobody does it like that, where, you know, you just write out the entire project that's so complex at one go. But then a lot of people, when they see such work, they have a different reaction to the one that you had, which is, oh my gosh, you know, I will never be able to deconstruct this. I will never be able to do something similar. So uh, the process of uh, sort of uh, the decomposition and, you know, tackling uh, piece by piece and sort of trying to link it to what you already know, or maybe developing the understanding in just that limited area. Uh, do you think that uh, that's what you maybe got uh, through your studies, through electrical engineering? Is there a link there, do you feel, or uh, maybe it originates from, from something else? Um, I mean, my studies were vaguely useful in that <laughs> there were some other of things I was interested in anyway. I didn't feel like the, the formal structure taught that kind of thing very well. Um, mm -hmm. But from my personal, like my hobby electronics, that was very much the same kind of figuring out, can I build part of the circuit first? Okay, this part is definitely producing the right voltage. This part is definitely like blinking, but the final result, it's not playing the noise. Like, so you, you're figuring out where the issue is. Um, yeah, so I think that was less okay. of like any particular course or thing. Um, more just like the more you do those kinds of projects um, versus like backing off and never trying the thing, the larger the mm -hmm. scope of things that you could try becomes, you know. Um, so I think, yeah, just ha having started, you know, and d in retrospect, things that they were silly to even think I could do that. And I failed on a lot of those things because there's no way I could build that or, you know, get that working. But in the process, you've at least started trying, right? Um, so I think that mm -hmm. was helpful. I think seeing other people go through that process is very helpful as well. Um, and so, yeah, I've worked with people who are excellent at doing that, at taking a big thing that seems overwhelming and saying, well, what can we do? What are the pieces that we understand? Um, and I think, yeah, the more you can find people trying to share that process, I think that's that's very useful as well because you can bootstrap off them rather than suffering alone. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so when did you encounter those people who are so good at at this sort of thing was it uh, like on the job or who are so good at you know breaking down a project how did you run into them yeah i mean i think i've been very fortunate with my work history i, I haven't had mm -hmm. terrible bosses or boring jobs so i was always doing bits of <laughs> vacation work or yeah even the consulting was with friends who i knew through some other work um, that were very, cool. very competent and good at what they were doing. Um, I had some excellent so, mentors so, early yeah. on. This this lady who hired me for that initial ecology work, she was incredible, incredible mentor and teacher. And she, yeah, um, she also had that ambition of like, oh, you know, <laughs> if we just think about it, like <laughs> we're smart. Like if anybody can figure it out, we should be able to figure it out um, re regardless of any like resource constraints or any other problems. So that was fun. That was very inspiring. And she had this attitude of like, I need to get this guy who's fresh out of high school and doesn't know that there's barriers because she tried hiring like people at university and the university had almost taught them like, no, you can't do that. And so she'd have these uh -huh. students who like, tell me what to do. And she'd say, could you do this? Like, oh, we don't know how. So she was like, right. So that was one of the reasons she recruited me was like, I need someone who hasn't been like corrupted yet, you know? <laughs> so let me get this <laughs> youngster who doesn't even know this is not supposed to be easy and tell him like, oh, you can figure the computer stuff out. Off you go. <laughs> um, <good luck. laughs> no, th th this is great. Uh, I feel that we need something similar in uh, with LLMs, you know, somebody who is who has this open mind uh, as to the possibilities, right? Like a, a similar uh, reasoning uh, in terms of uh, not being corrupted by the past status quo, but how this awesome technology can be applied in probably ways that we we don't uh, even foresee it. But uh, uh, so what I'm hearing you saying is that hanging around hackers makes you become a hacker, sort of. And in my experience, I've been trying to look a little bit for this lost inspiration that I had a couple of years ago that maybe dwindled a little bit over recent years. And 
uh, one thing that is working really well for me is yeah just just seeking out the the hackers you know the the, the people who with constrained resources are doing amazing things and just by seeing their process but but maybe i already understand the process uh, uh, or okay i feel i understand the process of decomposition that you described because i also experienced this uh, in my journey into machine learning and ai or maybe programming in general but uh, the inspiration you get from seeing people uh, doing things that you would think that would be impossible with with you know with a technology or with kind resources is is absolutely vital for me and, and motivating and inspirational and, uh, one thing you mentioned is that uh, you would uh, look at a paper and there would be this uh, weird equation that maybe you understood or maybe you didn't understand. And that thought, like, you know, we were discussing ancient times. That was before the LLMs, because right now you just take a picture, you pass it on to, you know, GPT-4 or, or cloud, and you can talk about that equation. Like, how awesome is that? Uh, has your workflow changed through those tools? Definitely. Yeah. I mean, I've used that exact thing you're describing to say, oh, here's an equation. I kind of understand what it's doing. It's some sort of distribution, but okay. Here's the screenshot of the, the equation. Turn that into code, plot that function for me, please. You know, like turn it into something tangible. Um, yeah. So I've used that kind of thing a fair bit, um, looking at like summarizing some references. So I don't have to read all of the references, but like, what is this talking about? This is the original context. Um, yeah, so that's definitely like a, a useful tool. And it's also, it's also a bit of a brain hack, right? Because how do I understand this thing that you might not have the answer to that? How do I copy and paste this into the, the model and then see what it says? Like that's a pattern that you, you know how to do, like you know that works. And then hopefully what the, the language model tells you, maybe it's a little bit wrong or it's a little bit off, but it at least gives you like some keywords or something to say, oh, okay, tell me more about that. Well, let me go research that. Um, and so it's taking something that is just a blank wall, like, oh, I don't understand this. And now it's like, but what I do understand is I can copy and paste this into this. I can make it plot it. I can make it tell me about it. You know, it's like a little shortcut for your brain to say, well, here's something that I do understand. It's like a building block that I can use. And then from there, hopefully it solves the original thing in a, a more like approachable process. So you're turning the hard things into simple things and then the simple thing, the hard things become the simple things through the process because you build up to them. That's uh, that is very cool. That is, that is absolutely very cool. So uh, wh what excites you most about LLMs? Uh, uh, is it uh, what they can do for you in your own life or the impact that they can have? Yeah, I mean, I think part of our thesis at answer.ai is that that's a question, like what are these things useful for? Is still a very open question. Um, mm -hmm. I think one of the reasons they're exciting to, so so like I am the, the perfect target audience for LLMs, right? Because I have lots of new hobbies all the time that I, I don't know anything about, but they're well documented on the internet what kind of nutrient should I put for my tomato plants if they're looking like this? What, how do I order? The, what's this thing called in this domain? Like that kind of question answering, they're really good at. And so that's great. Like I find them very useful. And then the second thing is coding. Um, you know, some people coding, it's like, I'm always in the same code base. I know it extremely well. Every line of change is like multiple days of consideration and careful testing and all of that to do. And so then you say, well, these language models, they're not so good. They're just good for throwaway code. But if you're doing a project every day or project every week, and a lot of that is throwaway code, I just want to plot this thing and then throw away all of that. Again, the language model is very well suited to that. So for me, it's very exciting now. These things are already very useful. I write a lot of code with them. I answer a lot of questions with them. I search a lot of documents with them. I filter a lot of training data with it. Like it's a very useful tool. But for the average person, it's like, okay, how many times do you ask weird questions in a new domain every day? Not that many. How many times do you write code? Like never, like most the average human being doesn't write any code, right? That's just, we're weird mm -hmm. like that. And so figuring out like, <laughs> what is this thing good for, for, <laughs> you know, what's like, how do you extend the usefulness? How do other people get some of those similar kinds of utility? Um, without having to be this weird nerd who just happened to have the right hobbies and work that aligns with 
what these tools happen to be good at for now? I think that's a very interesting question. And I don't know that, that I have a lot of good answers yet. No, that, that is a very interesting question. And I have never heard it phrased like this. So I'm really excited and curious for the answers you will be finding as part of <laughs> answer AI. That, that, that does sound exciting. Uh, Jono, maybe a slightly unrelated question, but it has been on my mind. Do you think that everyone should have a 3D printer? Mm, I think that everyone should have access to a 3D printer, but that's mm -hmm. different to owning it. Um, so owning mm -hmm. a 3D printer these days is quite plug and play, but it's still mm -hmm. like a commitment to you fiddling with settings and you're learning a new software in the computer and you're you know, looking after the plastic so that it doesn't get too damp. And it's a lot of like, it's still a lot of maintenance, but it's very, very powerful if you like to make things. I use it very often around the workshop and the garage and the desk even like, it's just, it's a really fun tool. Um, but I think most people, it's not worth it to be the owner who has to like baby it and manage it and learn it um, until you have like lots of use cases, right? So if you're thinking like, oh, maybe I'll just print one thing chances are you'll buy a 3D printer, you'll print the one thing, and then you'll probably not use it again for six months, and then you've forgotten how to set it up, you know? So, but you might find that this is amazing, it changes your life and you have to have this thing. So why I say everyone should have access is, I think like I used to run a service in university printing for people. Then the people who find mm -hmm. that this clicks like, oh, I can make whatever I want, this is amazing, I'm gonna use this all the time, they can get a printer. But the people who like, oh, that's kind of neat. Honestly, the services now, you can upload a 3D file, it'll come in less than a week. It costs like $4, um, you know, or less to get five of your part. Um, that's much nicer for like majority of people, I think, until they realize, oh, this is something I really want lots of. And then, yeah. So do you find that a 3D printer enables you in your hobbies, in your pursuits of your curiosity? Is it one of your secret or maybe not so secret anymore superpowers that allows you to pursue so many things? It is uh, in the same way that like computing is a general purpose technology, like it enables lots of different things. And LLMs, I think are quite a general purpose thing. I think a 3D printer is like a general purpose web, super weapon. Yeah, you're, you're right. Because it just means that any new problem you look at, like, oh, I'm trying to find something that fits into this bottle that holds this amount of material that I can grow my plant in. Any like question that involves some physical object you have now this extra option on the list. It's like, oh, look around and see if I've got something like that. Like check the scrap wood bin. Have I got a piece that's the right shape that I could carve? There's now a third option, which is like, make this materialize from nothing. <laughs> you know, like put this into the magic machine um, and have it like spit out the, the piece you want. Um, and so, yeah, that is, it's fun to have that option for any problem you look at. And I've been trying to do more physical things because my work is all computers, I'm trying to do like more like real life things. And then you, you see something like, oh, I really wish I had a piece that fit in here that I could hang this on or, or something like that, you know? Um, you've now got this extra thing in your brain. Says, well, that's a problem I've solved before. I just need to draw the, the 3D part and then put it on the machine and then wait an hour or two. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's that's a very fun little magic trick to be able to do. Uh, and, and I love how you mentioned magic because uh, for some time the analogy for code that you know uh, would come to my mind was that uh, and and i obviously heard it somewhere else it's not my idea but a code is the closest thing to magic that we have because we use these incantations these magical words and we construct words that exist in our computer and we can do various things but it seems like that that 3d printer could be an extension of that into the real world, you know, into the 3D world, uh, the, the world around us. Uh, so that's mm. that's uh, extremely interesting. Uh, and you also mentioned that you're now looking for um, a bigger, let's say, um, you know, um, of connecting the computer world with the real world, right? Like uh, in your in your hobbies, in your passions. Uh, I'm not sure if you've been following robotics and what's happening during the. AI world because there seems to be something interesting going on there. Yeah. Yeah. And 
You know, the physical stuff is is really hard. Like as someone who's done electrical engineering and a bit of like the robotics control stuff versus code, getting something to work in the in the real world, there's just a lot more barrier. Um, and the software is hard for robotics. So it's like a double a double thing. So it's really fun to see A, people getting much better at the physical stuff. Like there's just every year nicer motors and drivers and better support for different software and like ways to make it more approachable. Um, and then, yeah, with the AI, like people starting to finally say, oh, we've got good enough simulations that we can do simulation that actually copies over into the real world. Or we've got more efficient algorithms that like finally is like practical to run on these devices. We've got better hardware that we can run, you know, proper vision on something tiny and low power. Uh, yeah, that's that's a very fun space. I can definitely see myself being tempted to to dabble in that <laughs> direction. <laughs> yeah. Will, will be super interesting to, you know, w- watch how your hobbies develop. Uh, I'm curious about the purple tomatoes as well. Whether, you know, if you have a purple uh, pizza sauce, please do post it on <laughs> Twitter, you know. Um, so uh, I, I think that uh, uh, at least... Uh, uh, I feel that some of my curiosity has been satisfied today. I learned so much about how mm-hmm. you do the things that you do. So thank you so much for that. But maybe if I could please ask you two more questions uh, for those oh, please, people yeah. who are who are considering getting into AI, into machine learning, and maybe they're a software developer or maybe they're learning to code as well. What would be the path that you would recommend that they take? So I'm going to say two things that are almost, they they might seem contradictory. Um, The one is that it's worth just playing with the existing technology. And and specifically, like if you want to get into AI and LLMs and you're hearing all about this stuff, spend some time like familiarizing yourself with like what it can do in the, the least like entry way possible, right? So don't worry about code, try things just in the playgrounds online or in these chat things have fun and, and play around in a, a like a low consequences way. Um, but then the second thing is like, don't just go in just for the sake of I'm going into LLMs because that's exciting and I'm excited. Um, I think there's so much hype and there's so many people pursuing just, oh, I'm just doing AI for the sake of AI. And, and it's just because I've heard AI is big and I want to do it. If you can come in with like actual uses that you want to do and or problems that you want to solve. And that's why I say, do the playing around, even though that sounds like just going in. Play around just to get an idea, but then try and think of like, what are some actual use cases I can try with this? And maybe you'll find that it's not an actual use case that doesn't suit it very well, but maybe you'll find like, oh, this is something that practically I can actually do that's that's useful. Um, because I, yeah, that's kind of like my worry at the moment is that there's so much hype. We all, how do I get into this thing? I want to get into this thing. It's like, why do you want to get into this thing? At the end of the day, you know, it's really nice to want to code, but you you want to code because you want to make the computer do things. It's very nice to want to, I don't know, 3D print, but the 3D printer just spits out plastic. You you actually have to have a use down the line at some point or a reason. Mm -hmm. Um, And the reason can be education, but like if you can come into AI and you can say, you know, I'm coming into AI, but I really want to be able to look through my company's like backlog of scans and I want to be able to pull out data so that we can like better serve our customers. That's great. And I think you'll have a much nicer time than someone who just says, I've heard AI is cool. I saw the AI engineer salaries, you know, sign me up. Mm-hmm. Uh, give me the AI. <laughs> um, yeah, <laughs> use case is a better way. Oh, this, the, I love this. And uh, there are so many things in, in what you shared. Uh, first of all, like combining AI with a domain, with domain knowledge. I've I keep seeing it over, over and over again, and this is so powerful. Uh, sort of, uh, if you only focus on developing this one leg AI, that that's that chances are you know we will not get as far, or your motivation will run out, or, or whatnot. Um, plus, project-based learning, where you know where, where you sort of figure out in the project what you need, and you learn that as opposed to just packing things in your head. Uh, just because you feel that maybe they can be useful, but 90% of that stuff and ends up not being useful for anything. And uh, the other thing that the whole hype of AI and people getting into the field, generally, you don't want to be where everyone else is, right? You don't want to be, you don't want to be uh, competing with, with everyone. You want to 
have a niche uh, of your own. And um, that's uh, sort of what I found, for instance, with recommender systems. Recommender systems run the world, but you will not find courses about Rexis. You know, you will not find many tutorials, many blog posts about how to get into Rexis. And I bet that there are many other domains uh, like that, uh, that are uh, extremely exciting and lucrative. Um, but all right. And uh, Jono, w- would you be so kind and do something similar, but for electronics, if somebody would want to get into the re- real world, you know, uh, how would one go about that instead of doing five years of electrical engineering? <laughs> um, or, or is yeah, electronics it... harder than AI, you know, because maybe, who knows? You know, it's 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 not. It's doable, especially now. There's like there's really good kits available. There's really nice like modules. So I think that's one thing with electronics. You can design something completely from scratch. You make the circuit boards. You put all the things on. You program everything yourself. Um, but there's also like you can buy a light detector or something that detects when a beam is broken or something that measures the temperature or something that turns a switch on and off when you give it some signal. Um, and so I think that's one that yeah. There's lots of modules out there to do. Um, And so, you know, if we think back to like, we're talking about the the magic and and the general purpose technology. With with, um, computers, you're saying to someone, if you can express something very carefully, you can make the computer do that. And so if you have a repetitive task and you can express that, you can now, it can do it as many times as you want. And that's amazing if you have a repetitive task that you want to do. And so with LLMs, you're saying, oh, if you can, you know, specify this to take in some text and produce some other text and you can frame your task in that way, you know, then you can do this kind of thing. With electronics, the, the piece that you're telling someone is like unlocking for them, hey, did you know that you can like read an interface with the real world? And then you can modify that. You, 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 can, you can control things in the real world um, by moving these electrons around. And there's ways to read in inputs and there's ways to produce outputs like actuators. You can get little things that move back and forth, things that spin around, things that push back and forth, things that light up, things that heat up. Um, And so if you can frame your problem of like, oh, I'd like to measure this and then do that or wait until some condition is met, you can use some code. Um, Yeah, then you can start to like, okay, cool. Then I've got my problem. I've got my project. You can go and see what modules are out there to tell you what capabilities you could have. You look for examples, you dive in, you know, you find some projects. Yeah, so then it becomes like that same kind of learning path, but just... You know, you have to know that this is possible. Like most people, oh, I didn't know I could control the world. Like, yeah, you could put a soil sensor, you know, like a soil moisture sensor, and you could wait for it to get too dry, and then you could turn on the watering pump. Like that's a very simple project. There's lots of so it was like, whoa, I can I can do that. Okay, what if I put a temperature thing instead, and then I turn on my heating mat? Yeah, sure. <laughs> you know, and then you go from there, and you start realizing all the things you can do that you didn't think you could do. So you're saying that. Uh, there are these uh, high level building blocks sort of that you can start with you know you don't have to get down to the level of the electron or chemical uh, properties of you know what goes into this sensor or that sensor is you can um, again apply a similar uh, pattern that you discussed with llms with ai uh, but to, to to electronics so okay that is that is uh, extremely uh, motivating and fascinating mm. Jono mm-hmm. thank you so much my friend this has been yeah. terrific uh, uh, so many good things here I will re-listen to it at least once if not more because <laughs> this has been great so th- thanks for sharing all the good stuff with with, with me and, and oh, the listeners thank you for asking the good questions that felt a, a fun interview <laughs> yeah it was terrific thank you so much take care see you soon <laughs> cool. <laughs> bye